Hello, everybody. Thanks very much for joining us today. This is the Salamandra UK Tech and SaaS Multimedia uh, Marketing Meetup. And just to give you a little bit of uh, background of what that's all about, we bring together a network of marketing and industry professionals within the tech and SaaS world. And uh, we host these every eight weeks, more or less, uh, to hear from industry experts on all things marketing in tech and SaaS, covering a range of topics from uh, strategies and tools to best practice and success stories. Each event includes presentations from a number of speakers, followed by a panel discussion and Q&A session. So do feel free to put in your questions in the Q&A. And at the end, Abby's going to help us um, to answer those questions. And she'll unmute you if you'd like to actually personally ask the questions or have that chat. Um, so this is our fifth Tech and SaaS uh, multimedia marketing event. And we've got around 240 members. So that, that's fantastic growth. And today's meeting uh, topic is seven minutes to become a MarTech expert. And we've got five amazing speakers today. So what we found is the uh, pandemic has had a mixed impact on marketeers um, from actually questioning whether the CMO role is becoming extinct to, to uh, virtually all businesses turning to a digital marketing as a means of survival. So making that role of a digital marketeer one of um, great importance and actually a sought after job. But on the flip side, marketeers will be expected to deliver on revenue and customer acquisition with many marketeers anticipating continued budget cuts, unfortunately. And it's within this frame that uh, marketing technology, or MarTech as it's called, is seen to be a key component for recovery with over 60% of leaders planning to increase spend on technology in 2021, according to Gartner. So at Salamander, we're very lucky because we work um, remotely and uh, being visual problem solvers, we actually started to ramp up our digital marketing efforts before the pandemic hit. So we were quite lucky in that perspective. Um, and we also fall into the cohort of companies that are planning to increase spend in tech this year. So we're really excited to hear what, uh, what our lovely speakers are having to say today and what we can pick up in seven minutes from each speaker. So without further ado, I'll introduce you to our first speaker, who's Julia Burton-Brown, uh, Commercial Director uh, EMEA at InSkin Media. So Julia joined InSkin in 2016 as International Sales Director, becoming Commercial Director across EMEA in mid-2020. Along with running the sales team in Germany and the UK, she's overseen the launch of offices in the Netherlands and Canada. And Julian's in, Julia's innate leadership skills are driven by her ability to harness individual strengths, helping people flourish in their roles. So as well as expanding into new territories and launching new e-commerce formats, Julia has overseen two hugely important partnerships for InSkin with RightThing Media and Kevai. So Julia's talk will discuss Lumen's research data that shows that high impact non-standard formats can generate 15 times more attention than standard display units. So take it away, Julia. Thanks very much, Christine. Right, let me share my screen here. Excellent, okay. Um, so seven minutes, let's go. Right, attention is a hot topic this year. Um, so I'm going to tell you why and what we're doing about it. So first of all, who we are. So InSkin specializes in multi-screen, high impact brand digital advertising. So essentially we generate attention for advertisers across all verticals. So we design, build and distribute high impact digital advertising formats for brands. And we're a market leader in building quality creative. So why attention is a hot topic. If an ad isn't seen, it can't have an impact. It really is as simple as that. And there's clear evidence that ad campaigns with higher attention drive strong outcomes such as ROI, sales, conversions, awareness, brand favorability and perception. And this has also been cited in recent reports like Dentsu's study into unlocking the new currency of attention and the Attention Council's meta-analysis of over 50 research projects proving the impact attention has on brand outcomes. And the current industry metrics just aren't good enough. So viewability only tells you if your ad has had, had the opportunity to be seen, but not if it has been seen. So it only tells you half the story, if that. So this looks like a complicated slide, but the data here is pulled from T-Vision, Lumen and Ubiquity. So the chart shows the seconds of attention per impression for various media formats, and then it plots the cost per impression. And the white circle is where Lumen say that we sit. Um, so there are known factors that drive attention. So time in view and screen real estate are the two key drivers, which is why we generate as much attention as we do, because we run on premium publishers where consumers spend a lot of time reading the content. And as you've seen, we've got a big canvas to get creative on. And it's an important point to make here that not all media is the same and not every route to attention is equal. 
So what we're doing about it, uh, we've partnered with Lumen Research. So they're the leading attention measurement provider in the UK to provide third party object, so object, objective third party attention metrics on every campaign. And we're the first format provider to do so. So what we report on, we report on attention per thousand impressions, average visual engagement time per impression, percentage of impressions looked at and total attention for the whole campaign. So we're the first to do this, but we really don't want to be the only ones. This should become the norm for how digital campaigns are measured. It's so much richer and more valuable than just measuring clicks. So as we all get better at this, and I mean, not just in skin, but the industry as a whole, marketers will be able to measure attention across their entire digital campaign and then optimize towards it. So I'm not suggesting that there's no place for standard display, but I am suggesting that high impact digital should be on every plan. Um, and it will be even better if everyone measures it in the same way. So you've got a single currency to measure attention. And we've seen it before when brand safety and viewability were the hot topic. So now we all need to pull together on attention because it's the direction of travel for the industry and it's absolutely the right one. So how it works, uh, data from Lumen's eye tracking panels is turned into a predictive model of attention. So this model estimates how much attention an ad is likely to produce given a number of characteristics. So these are the characteristics. So these are the things that Lumen take into account. So size, screen real estate, ad positioning, um, and what other, other ads are on the page. So ad clutter, there's, there's lots of research to show that if there's tons of ads on the page, none of it's gonna get any attention and it's also a terrible user experience for the, for the consumer. Uh, time in view, scroll speed, format, and domain. So the model is deployed within the LAMP tag, which is the Lumen attention measurement platform and it's appended to your creative. So every time an ad is served, it pings back saying how long it was in view, where it was served on the page, how quickly the user was scrolling, et cetera. And then the Lumen attention model is applied to make a prediction of how likely the user was to have looked at it and for how long. And the results are in. So in skins formats deliver significantly more attention per thousand impressions than any other form of digital advertising. And they actually share greater similarities in terms of attention to that of a 15 second TV ad, which is, which is huge when you think about all the production costs involved in, in producing a TV ad. Um, and, and having measured attention on campaigns since the beginning of the year, we found actually that we generate up to 20 times more attention than standard display, which is even better than the 15 X in the headline. Um, and this is why we believe high impact digital should be a category on its own, like social is or video is, uh, but instead it's bundled into display advertising, which really diminishes its value and its impact. So high impact digital is an area that we're really keen to help promote and develop with other high impact uh, partners. I know Adnami you'll be hearing from as well later. Um, so let's not forget the creative. So um, let's really not forget about the part creative plays in generating attention. It's also the number one driver of trust in advertising. Yet the importance of creative in digital has just got a bit lost along the way because the industry has been so caught up in short term click driven efficiency wars. And we've left the importance of the creative execution behind. So Rory Sutherland spoke last week on the campaign podcast. So the title was on the war path to elevate the role of creativity. It's worth a listen, um, but the part that really resonated was when he said, creativity is the magic fairy dust that just gets added in the end, at the end, when this is the stuff that really needs to be thought about upfront when planning your campaigns. You know, targeting capabilities are now more sophisticated than they ever were before. And the nature of digital means that unlike TV or press, you can potentially book a campaign and go live on the same day. But there is a flip side to this efficiency, and that is that campaigns are often built with TV and press assets with limited turnaround times, so you don't get, get the best result for them. Um, and this lack of importance placed on creativity has really impacted the value of standard display formats and the consumer experience, because consumers you know, won't look at shit ads and it also makes your site look kind of, you know, not as, not as good as it should. Uh, but with high impact digital formats like ours and others, uh, we have a canvas and a user experience that can deliver more effective advertising for all parties in the interaction. So that's the advertiser, the publisher and the consumer. So final thoughts, long-term brand building with smart, consistent creative will drive awareness and sales. So much digital marketing is short-term performance-based and it feels like the balance should be reset. 
old themes are returning, creativity and context are back on the agenda, which is fantastic news. And now we can properly measure the impact of it. That's me done in seven minutes. Thank you very much. That was amazing, Julia. Thanks very much. Um, I'm always fascinated by um, eye tracking uh, uh, technology. It's uh, something which is quite ama amazing. And it's, it's lovely to hear that creativity is very much uh, uh, an important ingredient, a vital ingredient as part of those campaigns, because obviously that's kind of what, what we love doing. So thank you for that. Um, next up is Steph Miller, Commercial Director at, at NAMI. Um, so Steph is a Commercial Director at, um, at, at NAMI, where she's responsible for setting up the UK arm of the business, as well as leading the commercial team. A dynamic and visionary leader, she understands the challenges faced by all parties when it comes to buying creatively impactful digital ads at scale, frequently identifying huge opportunities. So her talk today is gonna to cover that the fact that with audiences disappearing from the above the line advertising channel, brands are being challenged to achieve impact through mobile and digital channels. We'll hear how marketeers can adapt creatively with high impact and why creative transformation and contextual matters more than ever. So take it away, Steph. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the good news is I'm going to reiterate, I think, a lot of the stuff that, or echo a lot of the stuff that Julia was just saying. Um, so it means that we're aligned on things. So I will just share my screen. Hang on two seconds. So yeah, hi everybody. Thanks for the introduction, Christine. That was lovely. Um, as she said, I'm Steph Miller. I'm commercial director for the UK for Adnami. So what is going on? Um, the past 16 months, I would say, have been the weirdest, most subversive ever and hopefully will ever experience. Um, we've been stuck inside and that's driven huge behavioral changes, notably our online behavior. Online traffic has exploded and confidence purchasing online has become more and more commonplace. Digital 360 recorded e-commerce up by over 45% year on year in 2020 versus 2019 and with stronger trends actually predicted already for 2021. And that means that digital advertising has a much louder voice than it ever has before. And you need to ensure that you take advantage of this change and really make the most of it. So how do you do it? High impact ads are, as you've seen from Julia's presentation and, and here, are typically really large. And it's well-documented knowledge that size of an ad is very decisive in the amount of attention that it will generate. I like to liken high impact advertising to window shopping on a busy shopping street. How many shops do you walk past on Oxford Street or Bond Street um, with tiny windows and even smaller window displays? I'll answer it for you, none. <laughs> so why then would you choose to have a busy Oxford Street forum and use anything other than the biggest, brightest window to display your brand? At Adnami, we believe that a great creative deserves a great canvas, which will lead to better impressions and more brand recall. But you also have to decide what success looks like in your campaign. With this plethora of metrics at your fingertips in digital advertising, that the industry, it's, it's caused the industry to become very complicated and noisy. CPA, CPC, CPV, viewability, clicks, impressions, conversions, you know, this just, it just goes on and on. And when you start to compare them against each other, it, it gets even more complicated because sometimes it looks like your campaign has been very successful using certain metrics. And then you look at it again with others and it can be a flop. So I think it's essential to decide from the very start of your campaign, what success looks like to you at each stage of the funnel, and then tailor your campaign and your measuring tools and your messaging to monitor that accordingly. Make sure that your creatives and your messaging are set up to deliver that particular goal that you're trying to achieve. In a recent white paper from Dentsu, they said, effective media planning is more important than ever to drive cut through. We believe that current metrics and measures of success in media do not go far enough. And Julia mentioned it with attention. I, I agree, like we can't go further. Um, we're not going far enough at the moment to measure campaigns. And at Adnami, we believe that the time's right to change the way that we measure success. Attention isn't a standard industry metric at the moment. It's viewability, which we do welcome and agree is a good metric. But also remember that with viewability, you're comparing one second of a small format versus one second of a very large format. And which one would you prefer? 
Looking at viewability in isolation, I don't think will give you a strong enough indication to determine the value of two different types of ads. I think personally, we've reached a time where the current measures that we have have become antiquated and they've almost been a stopgap ahead of real effectiveness. So it's time to monitor and focus on attention. In the same Dentsu study that I just mentioned, and as you can see from the graph on the screen, they found the longer an ad is viewed, the more likely it is to be remembered. So with your campaigns, why not focus on increasing dwell time, attention, and ultimately your brand recall? So what drives attention? And looking at data released by Lumen recently, there are four key drivers of attention. Size, larger formats and video formats are disproportionately likely to be seen. Time, the longer an ad is in view, the more likely it is to be seen. Context, an MPU on the times will get four time, 14 times more attention than one served on eBay and creative. Your media strategy can be absolutely perfect, but without a strong creative, it's unlikely to make a big impact. But you've got to make sure that your ads are in the right place. Typically, digital display, as Julia also touched on, have sat at the bottom of the funnel with low budgets to drive the cheap clicks to the site at the end of a campaign. And with high impact formats, you're able to start exposing your brand to digital consumers from the very top of the funnel all the way through the process, as long as you've got a clear focus on messaging changing throughout your campaign. Our recommendation would be focusing on brand recall, awareness, core values at the start of the funnel, your key metrics being dwell time and attention, moving through to more interactive, specific product messaging at the end of the funnel and looking at your clicks and conversions at that stage. So to summarize, today, context and creativity, I think are the new data. Data has been in the driving seat for the last decade and a half and the next era needs to be about creativity. There's got to be an attitude shift in metrics and what we're all looking for in campaigns and I think that's got to change relatively quickly. Um, I also think more branding budgets are going into digital and therefore a lot of changes in the way advertisers are going to produce the creative. Moving away from clicks and thinking instead of in, instead in terms of value, content, and real experience with the ad itself. And I think these richer ad experiences can only drive better long-term results. In terms of creative impact, I'd say buy the biggest formats that you can <laughs> um, and buy programmatically because it gives you flexibility and control. Use video and experiment with formats and interactivity to really increase your brand recall and make your brand raw, just like this line. And that's it. Thank you. Love it. Thanks very much, Steph. And thanks very much for the analogy of the uh, the high impact digital like uh, shop windows. It's made me want to go and do some uh, some retail uh, therapy, but uh, <laughs> not quite so easy these days. <laughs> but that's brilliant. Thank you. Uh, so next up, we've got Dan Jones, uh, commercial director at Cavai. Um, so uh, Dan is. Um, following his 15 years of experience in the digital industry and extensive knowledge of brand and performance digital media. He's led programmatic platforms at Adform and headed up the pr programmatic team at Venetus Media. In his role at Cava, he is tasked with working with media agencies and developing all partner opportunities together with UK publishers and rich media specialists. So today he's going to discuss how conversational marketing can engage consumers, the importance of a creative user experience, and why savvy marketeers should always be thinking outside the box. Take it away. Thank you very much. Lovely introductions and also a very cool uh, previous two uh, speakers. I'm going to probably reference uh, and uh, make a nod to the previous two speakers as well as throughout. So as Abby said, um, I want to talk um, from a different point of view, and the point of view that Kavai has uh, adopted from a creative point of view first, uh, which is in line with the previous uh, speakers. And I wanted to start with a, a point of reference from uh, a chat from one of the previous uh, companies at, uh, at Inskin, in actual fact, um, with whom we are integrated. And it's the last sentence of Dominic Tilson's um, 
message here, which is around the fact that the industry does need to return to a different type of metric other than viewability. But also the crucial element that needs to be picked up on is that whilst the programmatic has boomed, something else has become less important, which is, of course, creativity, which seems to be the theme um, of today. The other um, theme I'd like to pick up on is the world of cookulous, which is, of course, going to be looming soon. Uh, here's a, a starting um, point as well, which is the fact that all components of marketing, including tech, therefore, should be customer focused first. I'm not entirely sure who said that, but that is a, a paraphrase uh, from the world of marketing. If we take a definition of ad tech and uh, martech, there's two definitions here. Neither of these definitions necessarily do reference creativity. Also, neither of them necessarily reference being user centric. So the idea that we're using technology for the benefit of the advertiser and less for the consumer is, is probably a concern and may have caused some of the trends in user behavior over the last, say, five, 10 years. Uh, and also the fact that there's um, two different definitions there, but both allude to efficiencies rather than effectiveness. And both the two previous speakers there talk about, um, talked about uh, creative effectiveness and effectiveness in campaigns. So it's quite, quite um, a, a stark um, place to start. And as I mentioned, um, there is a world towards which we are moving um, inexorably. That, that world has been called the cookieless world. Um, so we probably should be considering that in all of our uh, campaign planning uh, right now, uh, ahead of the, the time when that uh, little cookie becomes fully deprecated, irrespective of what is going to replace it. Here's another thing I'd like to think about as well that I want to just um, talk on, which is, do we also need to rethink the online channel overall in the overall mix? Because if we are fixated on the online channel as being bottom of the funnel like as a sales channel, then we may fail uh, the consumer because there's more time being spent online than ever before. And as the other two uh, speakers uh, alluded, the point of online now is to really gain uh, attention. It's not just the bottom of the funnel stuff that we've been kind of used to over the ten, last 10, 15 years. And this is quite interesting. I read there was a, this last year that there was a mobile phone lane. Um, now, this is alarming because what this might mean is that users are not necessarily aware of the, uh, the ads that they might see in the outdoor world as much as they used to. And of course, we've had a pandemic that's going to change user behavior. Many more people are now focused online than ever before. I'm not suggesting here that we bombard people with ads on their mobile phones as they walk down the lanes. But what it suggests is they might miss out on the omni-channel advertising that uh, outdoor presents in terms of the upper funnel attention piece because they're so focused on, on their phones. So we need to be thinking about uh, what these user trends mean for the online uh, channel. And a question we uh, at Kavai really like to ask is, do we believe, do we really believe that engagement advertising, which tends to take place in the mid funnel, do we really believe that those advertising options could be better? And uh, of course, it's a leading question. But here's two uh, citations, uh, one from uh, Kavai's uh, CEO, Stefan Spartberg, who has long been saying that creativity is and should always be at the heart of advertising. Could not agree more. And our CTO, Mikko Katilla, uh, he uh, very presciently, I think this was in 2012, predicted that the cookie will soon fade away. So starting a company like Kavai in conversational technology based on creativity is quite a prescient thing to do. It's based on really solid uh, rationales. What we've seen as well is that over the course of time, users have been dismissing ads. So it might be a little bit better, for example, by asking them a question instead of just telling them something, that brands can all of a sudden become a little bit more relevant. If you ask them the question, you, you become relevant to their ears, as it were. And this is echoed by a chap called Mark Ritson. Um, I'm sure most people who are um, here on the call Will know of uh, Mark's um, quite sort of, he doesn't pull any punches, but he's been uh, saying for quite a while, look, he's agreeing. Why don't we just ask the consumer what they want and need instead of just telling them this all um, feeds into the mid funnel piece. So if we take those pieces of rationale, the big why, as it were, Simon Sinek might say, uh, we can then think about technology in MarTech and AdTech in a slightly different way. 
And one solution is not the only solution, but one really good solution that fits all of those pieces of rationale is decision tree based marketing technology. And what that enables is brands to ask consumer questions and provide answers, relevant ones, them to click on. So they don't have to write anything, they just click on answers and engage in a online conversation, as it were. So uh, what's missing from this image? Not soap, it's actually a plug. So uh, the plug is here, uh, which is conversational advertising can answer all of those questions that, we, and that we've just been raised uh, in, within the industry itself. How can we engage users? How can we be relevant? Um, how can we add creativity to the mix to make sure that that stays at the heart of um, advertising campaigns and campaign planning? So on the right-hand side there, there's a really cool ad that was out for uh, Dyson last year, where, the, where we write the dialogue, we write the questions and the answers with which user interacts. And it gives users a personalized micro journey, if you will. It's a nice bit of marketing fluff for a Wednesday morning. But the idea is that you get a really positive um, engagement and it's all about dwell time. And the really cool thing is that it's contextually driven, mainly, without the need uh, for cookie targeting, uh, nor do we uh, need to drop any cookies because we can gain insight at the back end without any need for um, cookie um, dimensions within ADMP. So in essence, this is decision tree based technology that solves the problem of, of engagement through creativity by asking the consumer relevant questions. Now then, all the good stuff takes place in the upper mid funnel, the awareness piece and the action piece at the top and the bottom has long been thought of as the real simple eyeballs impression and the click based activity. But there's much more that needs to be done in the mid funnel and as marketing budgets will be squeezed, but maybe need to be deployed more intelligently, it means that we can push up the funnel a little bit into the mid, where all the really cool stuff like discovery and education takes place, which is where you can really influence the, the consumer a lot more than you can um, in other areas. What's cool about conversational ads um, is that you can get up to 40 seconds dwell time, which is really, really important. That's a lot of times in order to in influence a consumer whilst researching online. The extra really good thing is that because users are actually clicking on quite small buttons, we see it's genuine user engagement. There's no accidental clicks here, and clicks need to be thought of as an old metric by now, we would argue. And adding to the mix whilst users are learning and discovering things about the brand, what happens after the event? We have seen through various brand lift studies that perception has improved and consideration has increased quite dramatically. So they really do fit into the overall marketing mix. And when conversational is integrated or part of, for example, uh, the upper funnel with awareness, um, especially with our um, integration with InSkin, for example, it can start to uh, create an, an efficiency in media planning and buying where marketing spend may be a little bit squeezed um, on in the, in the next few months and years. The really, really cool thing is that whilst uh, there's no cookie data being collected, what we see within uh, Flow Analytics within the Kavai Cloud platform is where users has, have indeed been clicking. So we can prove the engagement where users have been clicking on each node. Through uh, lockdown last year, what was interesting was Hewlett Packard ran uh, a campaign for a laptop called Spectre. And they asked the consumer what sort of um, features they'd be looking for in a laptop. And in three phases, phase one, pre-lockdown, phase two, during lockdown and phase three out of lockdown for the first time in, in a few months, what we saw is that users were clicking previously on uh, the lightweight chassis of a laptop as being the most important feature, as well as a uh, all day battery life. We went into lockdown. What was interesting is users we saw were starting to clicking on uh, mute mic button and webcam kill switch, which makes sense because you're at home and you might have a washing machine going or the baby crying in the background. So you want to kill the webcam and equally uh, make sure that no one can necessarily hear the noise in the background. That all makes sense, right? Because we're in lockdown. We come out of lockdown and people are back out and about again. What was really interesting is users were clicking uh, on all uh, answers equally and also all of the above, which made perfect sense. People had the taste of the use and the convenience of a mute mic button and all day battery life, as well as lightweight chassis and mute mic button. So we can show relevance to uh, engagement through Flow Analytics without the use of cookies. So if we, we combine creativity and contextual uh, relevance, 
we can deliver some really cool uh, engaging ads through the means of decision tree based technology for any brand but really focusing on that mid funnel uh, type piece which is all about discovery and education and therefore we're creating much more uh, readily disposed or predisposed consumers on the purchase and consideration front when they finally get through to that part if indeed they click or go to a relevant shop so what's cool about um, decision tree based technology is without the use of cookies we can enjoy the cookie world now before and also after the consumer engages using uh, conversational ads which are hopefully going to be um, taking an even greater foot um, globally as we go forward now thank you very much any questions I oh, will get to some questions at the end, Dan. That was amazing. That was re really interesting. And, and I love the, uh, the term clickable conversations. Not only is it nice to say, but it, uh, it makes total sense. Um, I love where it's all going, actually. It's, uh, it's, as I say, much more of a conversation and getting genuine um, sort of reactions rather than you know, potential wrong clicks, et cetera. Yeah. Really, really cool. We'll keep the questions to the end. Um, Abby okay. will be helping us um, identify those questions uh, that we can then ask uh, individual or you know, uh, for the group. So next up, we've got uh, Tom Jenin, uh, Chief Revenue Officer at Brand Metrics. Uh, so with 20 years experience in ad technology and media, Tom is a non-executive board director and consults to both startups and established tech companies, including Brand Metrics and Adnami. And as an experienced business leader and ad technology guru, Tom was behind the launch of AdMeld in Europe before it was sold to the internet giant Google, which is pretty impressive. Um, and today, Tom will discuss how marketeers can use brand lift data to develop insight and lead campaigns. So take it away, Tom. Thank you. Thanks very much. That was a uh, very nice, uh, very nice intro. So um, basically today we're going to talk about campaign brand lift and, and effectiveness in particular. I think what we had heard a lot so far is um, are some other kinds of metrics. Um, in this case, we'll talk about brand lift. And part of the reason is that we're going to see quite a lot of growth in the advertising market. I think last year, last April, certainly this time last year, no one knew what was going to happen. What we know now is that digital is back and it's back with a vengeance. Digital is going to, uh, digital advertising, according to Group M, is going to grow 24%. And we're seeing right now an impact, not just about regular uh, kind of what we've seen, uh, those very, very bottom of the funnel um, click-oriented campaigns, we're seeing brand measurement activity increasing dramatically. Um, and the reason for that is that brand strategy is of paramount importance to marketers. They are paying very close attention to their brand, as they would. And what's really important to them is that when they set a brand strategy, that they are establishing the metrics that they need to, to know that it's working so that they can invest in it. And um, the problem, the biggest problem, is that most of the time, those campaigns are not getting measured. And so what's, what's really critical it's a, is to understand all of those different metrics that we've been hearing about today. A lot of those metrics are, um, are attention metrics. They are uh, awareness metrics uh, in terms of, uh, did people see the, uh, the campaign? But what we're not seeing is a lot of measurement on brand lift. So, and that's because a lot of times the systems that have been out there so far have been Quite expensive to run. If you want to run a survey, you're going to um, have to engage with somebody. Um, there's going to cost 10, 15,000 in order to simply just get any kind of brand lift measurement. And so uh, we tend to run one or two or three a quarter. Um, and that means that the vast majority of campaigns are simply not getting measured. Unfortunately, what that means is that a lot of the investment that brand marketers are putting into their campaigns tend to go to the big platforms because the big platforms are going to give them brand lift measurement for a very small threshold of investment, say 10,000 on YouTube, for example. And that's a big problem for everyone else because if it's not getting measured, it's really, really hard to invest in it. So a typical uh, interaction with, uh, with a major publisher is going to be um, the agency or the brand saying, um, I really like your brand, I'd like to run a campaign, you know, will it work? And the brand will require some level of, of, of understanding that this campaign is actually working for, um, for them and is worth the investment. They'll want to try it out first before they put a lot of money behind it. 
but unless they're putting a lot of money behind it, they're probably not going to get much measurement included in the campaign. So in the end, if they know that they're going to be investing uh, a certain amount of money for their, for their budget, but only a certain amount of it is going to get measured, they're going to put more of that money where it's going to get measured. So in the end, they need to make sure that they're going to be able to get all of the campaign measured so that they can, um, that they can justify that investment back to their boss or to their client. Um, so what we've seen so far in digital is that actually there's a lot, the, the big F word in digital is fraud. And it's, it's that what we see in terms of cheap impressions, not necessarily actually a, a good value. Um, that data targeting, because the co cookies are going away, data targeting across domains is broken. And what we're seeing is that more and more, it's going to continue to be fractured. There's going to be a mixture of first party data of, of, of new kind of um, joined up cookies. Um, and there's going to be cohorts and flocks and others that are trying to put together more and more targeting um, approaches. But that ultimately the clicks themselves, which everybody is still spending a lot of time being concerned with, did we drive a click? Did we drive some sort of action? Those clicks are not corresponding to the brand marketer's business objectives. They actually ultimately want to see movements in sales, but they also want to see how the entire campaign is working. They're looking for the entire funnel, a full funnel measurement. And you know, in order to fill that gap that we saw, that big measurement gap in the campaigns that are not getting measured, some people are actually kind of trying to build their own systems. They've got some polling systems. They're trying a lot of different things. They'll try, um, they'll try panels, which are really expensive, but ultimately they are based on forced exposure and don't really work. So marking your own homework ultimately isn't really cutting it. And so brands and agencies are looking for third-party verification. The Telegraph really took this on board and they built a whole platform around, the whole concept around metrics that matter. They know what brands are looking for. Um, they wanna make sure that the strategies that they're designing um, actually results in movement on those metrics so that the brands will then give them more money. And so the attention metrics that we heard before, attention obviously is a really interesting signal. Um, they want to make sure that the ad was seen. If it was seen, it can have an impact. If it's not seen, it's not going to have an impact. Um, but what is that? What is that impact? Are we actually measuring um, awareness, consideration, preference, and action intent? So the Telegraph and other publishers, like the Guardian and others, are linking the strategies and the delivery metrics to the brand lift metrics that really ultimately are going to be driving further investment. So brand metrics, um, we're in business because we feel like there's a, there's a different way of doing this, that actually we can measure all of those campaigns. We can measure campaigns as small as 50,000 impressions. We can measure all of the different elements within that campaign. See, did this creative actually deliver more than that creative? Did this format deliver more than that format? Did this audience targeting or other targeting methodology deliver more than, than run of network or run of site? And so the way we do that is we really try to narrow that focus onto something that is that that we can do repeatedly, to automate that process, to make sure that um, it actually is you can scale it and it's not going to have uh, an undue impact on people, and, and teams, and then really ultimately change the mindset from should we measure this to actually why wouldn't we measure this. The first thing is actually coming back to those, the various funnels and charts that we've seen already today. You can kind of look at a campaign from the moment that somebody is exposed to the ad all the way to an actual purchase and even post-purchase. And in that first bucket are things that actually get measured a lot. And we're used to seeing those metrics all the time in part because they're good signals, but also because we can actually measure them at scale with current technologies. So impressions, viewability, attention, engagement, um, you know, did they play around with the ad? That's all interesting, but ultimately if it's bad creative or it didn't have the impact, or even if it had a negative impact, um, you won't know that unless you're actually measuring awareness, consideration, preference, and action intent. And ultimately action intent should be leading to clicks, purchases, uh, and store visits. 
So the idea ultimately is to try and measure that entire funnel so that you can go back to the brand and say, your campaign had all of these different effects that actually move the needle for the measurements that you're looking for. Um, the second thing that we do is we have uh, really automated the process using, uh, using scripts, partnerships with publishers, and ensuring that, um, uh, that we've simplified things down to one question, making it really consistent across from campaign to campaign. And then by being able to do that, you can actually start changing the mindset and working with um, all of the campaigns that a publisher is, uh, is, able to, um, is able to field. They get direct spend. If they know who the advertiser is from the beginning, um, it doesn't matter whether they have a relationship with, um, with uh, the, 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 the technology itself. It doesn't matter whether it's programmatic or it's direct. You can actually measure all of those campaigns. Um, and we have some campaigns, as I said, uh, that are getting measured consistently at 50,000 impressions and up. Because ultimately what we're doing is we're measuring brand awareness, brand consideration, brand preference and action intent on all significant campaigns and also making sure that those campaigns are consistent and comparable to the last campaign, to the next campaign, and then to benchmarks formed from all campaigns, which gives you quite a lot of data. Um, so imagine being able to walk into your client or walk into your, uh, your, your boss and be able to say, this is exactly what we delivered on that campaign and on every campaign. You can say, this is the level of awareness lift, consideration lift, preference lift, and action intent lift, and be able to show that actually the campaigns that we've been running and are running now and that we're going to run next are actually going to drive people towards the actions that the brand marketer is looking for. Um, and so that's what it, that's what it's doing. And then we're working with um, media companies and agencies now globally, um, 16 different countries. And um, hopefully that's something that is, uh, is continues to be appealing so that ultimately we can drive more of that spend away from the platforms and onto the open web and quality publishers. In the end, we want to improve campaign effectiveness. We want to be able to prove it with data. Um, we want to make sure that we're increasing investment in those full funnel strategies confidently and, uh, and then shift some spend from those platforms to publishers and diversify uh, the audience for greater effectiveness. And that's that. That's Brand Metrics. Of course, everyone's on mute, but it sounds, it looks like, it looks like there's a lot of clapping that's happening. Oh, there we go. Can you hear me now? Sorry, it wasn't yeah, allowed me great. to unmute. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. That was amazing. Um, metrics are so important, and it's so true that they say you can't uh, manage what you can't measure. So metrics are obviously very important so that we can manage all those things going forward. So that, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, and next up, we've got uh, Charlie Ash, uh, Creative and Client Success at TMWI. Uh, so he's Head of Client Data and Strategy, and Charlie manages creative and client success for the award-winning marketing agency TMWI. He works with their clients to use data and creativity to transform how brands can connect with audiences. Charlie is an expert in programmatic and he is a regular speaker and author on the subject within the industry. So on today's talk, um, we're going to learn the top tips to become a marketeer who truly embraces media, creative, data and tech. Marketing has evolved so much in the last 12 months, as we've already mentioned a few times. So he brings you wisdom and advice on marketing technology that you can implement straight away. So take it away, Charlie. Awesome. Thank you so much, Christine. Very, very kind introduction. Um, so yeah, hi, my name is Charlie Ash. Um, I am going to be coming at this a little bit from the agency angle um, for TMWI um in terms of uh what it is that we're trying to do when we look at installing martech on behalf of brands um if we go back to 2013 uh when smart and sorrel made uh, the quote that i think sort of um summarized where we were within the industry in terms of the increasing adoption of both technology and also of data uh, as he talked about the rise of math men over mad men um we really can take this all the way back to uh, the 19th century when John Wanamaker made his also very famous quote uh, of saying, half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. The trouble is I don't know which half. My challenge, I think, is that uh, 
as much as we have gone a long way down the journey, we certainly haven't solved that challenge yet. Um, and really a lot of the technology that we look at is still trying to achieve the same goal um, that we were originally sort of setting out to do back in the 19th century. Um, so TMWI, uh, as an agency, we work across multiple different areas of sort of service of product and technology for our clients. Uh, so we're from audience segmentation, analytics and insight, different channels and format, brand safety, optimization. We also run some of our own technology as well. And we work with a lot of different clients that work on both a national and a global level and also have different challenges and strategies as well. So some of these are e-commerce uh, brands, some of them are brick and mortar brands. And with that, as we start to implement technology, comes its own uh, challenges of the individual brands needing to make what is uh, a single piece of technology work across different strategies. And as other people have already touched on as well, we sit across a large range of different channels. Some of these are digital, are super data enriched, uh, are very quick to activate. Uh, and others are traditional channels, which are much slower to activate, which tend to be much more data poor and which tend to take longer to activate as well. Um, and the challenge, I think, for brands uh, and for agencies uh, on behalf of brands is how do we get all of these different pieces of technology, like many of the pieces of technology that we've heard about today, to all work together in a seamless piece of operation that actually makes our marketing better and not just more complex. Um, so I've gone through and done seven short tips uh, on what I think is important for brands uh, when considering pieces of technology. Now, Tom touched on uh, the silos that are increasingly being produced, uh, Google, Facebook, Amazon. Um, you know, these uh, Apple, well, not to miss those guys out, the, uh, what is increasingly happening is they're using their understanding of consumers uh, in order to have very accurate data for targeting, uh, to also own the media and also own the measurement. Uh, and there's a danger there from an advertising point of view that we don't necessarily get insight into what's happening within these silos. It's not always possible to break them down completely, uh, but what we increasingly want to do is to try and use data science to understand what's going on within the silos rather than necessarily just taking the metrics from those silos. So be aware of when you're working with someone that is a little bit more siloed on the data uh, and take appropriate measures towards it. Uh, another thing to be very conscious of is when we start to approach within technology, different technologies speak different languages. Uh, and I mean that in a simpler case of a user ID from one partner to another could be different. Uh, we've touched a lot on viewability. There are different viewability metrics that are adopted by different platforms. And it can be very confusing when we go and talk to these technology partners uh, because they want to speak in their own language. And I think a major part uh, and something that uh, Steph touched on uh, is that we want to try and challenge these technology partners and providers to actually answer the questions, the goals and the challenges that we've got as a brand in order to make sure that when they implement technology, it does what it is that we want them to do. Uh, and that will cause success on both sides. It's very easy to get a little bit distracted maybe with the sort of the shiny toys and all of the different things that are available and sometimes forget what it is that we were trying to achieve with a particular piece of technology. Another really key point is that automation is coming through in the industry. It's talked about a lot. Essentially, what we're trying to do is to get computers to do jobs quicker and more efficiently than we were able to do ourselves. Um, I don't think we're in danger anytime soon of a Terminator style AI takeover. Um, the main problem that we've got within AI and automation is actually that it will do the job that we pointed at almost to the point of fault. Um, there is a real danger that what it will do is essentially say, if you want me to achieve this goal, I will do anything possible in order to get that goal. Um, so we've got to be super clear on one, that the goal is valuable to us and that we can measure the value of that goal. Uh, and secondly, we've got to also make sure that we are measuring and keeping that platform to account uh, to continue to do what it is that we want to do. So automation is amazing, but approach it, approach it with a little bit of caution uh, and make sure that what you are pointing it towards is true success for you. Uh, content is something that, yeah, I think everyone's touched on today, which has been fantastic to hear. Um, uh, I was going through this before and I think, yeah, the, uh, the Andrex without the puppy is just toilet paper. Um, like it was just, uh, you've got to have that content that you're feeding into your marketing machine and you've got to be aware that the content journey, as many people have touched on is a different journey. It's not data. It's not real time. It's not technology. Um, and what we feed into this marketing machine 
is really, really key for the results that we get out from it. When it comes to data and measurement, uh, I would also say that specifically as, uh, as an agency and across marketing plans, anomalies are what are really actionable. Um, it's really easy to end up always uh, going up to the top level metrics, looking at global, uh, looking at cross channel spends and just seeing the general numbers. What we lose is a lot of the anomalies, which are what we can action, which is saying that site's working particularly well on that day. Let's go and get more of that or let's test that a little bit more. So as we start to use technology to wrap up insights from individual channels into uh, general marketing spend, make sure you don't lose sight of the anomalies. And last number seven point uh, is owning your own customers. Uh, as many people have touched on, uh, Dan specifically, around the cookie reduction, there is going to be less and less data out there, your first party data, and also taking a user centric view on what the experience is like for your individual users is going to be really, really key in making sure, again, that all of these technology providers and partners work in a way that achieves something that is beneficial for your advertising. And with my last 10 seconds, the final quote uh, is from Napoleon Hill, um, who's a self-help guy from the US. And he said, the subconscious mind is more susceptible to influence by impulses of thought mixed with feeling or emotion than by those originating solely in the reasoning portion of the mind. Uh, we need to look at content. We need to look at creative. As much as we are trying to be functional and accurate, we also need to make sure we are creating something that is a little bit beautiful as well. And that's me on seven minutes. That's fantastic. Uh, thanks for those top tips. They're really uh, succinct and to the point. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks to all the speakers and thank you to Abby to organize, for organizing all this. It's been amazing. Uh, but now we've got a few questions uh, from the uh, audience. Uh, so I wonder, Abby, if you could help us out with some of those questions for us. That would be amazing. Yeah, sure. So I think Dan's uh, ready to take this one. Um, are B2B companies using decision tree based marketing? Unmuted. You'll have to unmute everybody, I think. I, have to, I think I've got it now. Thank there you. Go. Thank you for the, the, the question, Abby. And yes, indeed, um, very good question from Danny. We are um, working with several uh, companies in the B2B world uh, currently, mainly in the, in the financial and the uh, energy space. So whilst they are very cool for consumer-based marketing, because they are very controlled and can provide really quite in-depth information within the decision tree itself, that it is very, very applicable to B2B. Uh, and the two companies uh, that are using us right now, for example, um, are using it to, to great success. So yes, it, it is applicable to B2B as well. Good question. Does that answer it? Great. Brilliant. Um, so we've got Casey asking, what are some big trends that you're anticipating in the second half of 2021? Is this too conversational? Um, Could be I'll to everybody, I suppose. To, yeah. I'll leave this open to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to go first? Um, I'll, I'll jump in on this one. Uh, and I think probably Steph will be saying, saying the same. But um, I think in, in kind of H2 of last year, we saw um, e-commerce formats coming to the fore. So that became a, a bit of a trend. And I can see that continuing even after kind of life opens up a little bit more. We're getting a lot more creative um, in in how we do, you know, e-commerce and, and shoppable formats. So I, I think that's a that's a trend. Um, and you've heard kind of a lot of us bang on about, you know, creativity and context. Um, so those and attention. So I think those those are the three buzzwords that you'll be hearing, you know, more more about in in the latter part of the year, um, because that's that's the way the industry is going, you know, post cookie, um, and also actionable and and, and measuring results. Okay. We're, getting, oh. we're getting a lot more briefs as well on interactivity as well within a unit and I think if you look at um, the size that you, the size of the unit that you get with high impact formats um, that lends itself very well to, to that kind of to that kind of thing and then also video. Indeed I'd like to echo that I think there's going to be quite a bit of a, uh, a trend in, in merging of various formats and technologies as, we, as we've already seen through uh, various integrations that are going on so maybe like conversational merging with skins uh, for example from our point of view and, and video merging with various other elements of the the visual marketing mix so i think that's going to be a, 
a clear trend, the merging and integration of, of um, existing technologies to really grab the consumer. So. And, and Dan and Steph, you both mentioned video. Um, in, in the video arena, do you see much animation? Because of course that's um, what, what uh, is our arena. Um, how, what percentage do you see as in live film footage and animation or mixture of the two? If you have that to hand, it'd be quite interesting to know. Don't have any data to hand per se, but with the customers that we're talking to, there's a clear uh, indication that uh, various forms of video that have been actually crafted specifically for online. Mm -hmm. um, not many brands uh, go out there and shoot uh, TVC and then go out and shoot something specifically for online. So I think where, where we've been talking about creativity being much more central, um, it'll be interesting to see how many brands actually go out there and produce and provide um, online specific pieces of video content um, that might be interacted with, I would say, mm. what we're seeing. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I'd say that there's the creativity makes a lot of sense for, for people who have been used to being able to target audiences directly, use their own data to, to in order to move the needle and see increases in performance. But actually, when you can't do that anymore, and, and looking ahead with, with in, into the cookie-less future, you won't be able to. Creativity and making investing in how to make that much more powerful makes sense. Obviously, um, measurement will make sense as well. And, and also thinking ahead beyond the cookie-less future is effectively an attributionless future. That user level data is going to be harder and harder and harder to access. That what Apple is doing is very, very similar to what we're gonna end up seeing from a lot of different parties, simply because um, that's, that's the trend. We can see that trend line continuing. So ultimately, we've all got to be aware that that, that if the walls are going to get higher, that if you don't have a wall, people are gonna start building them. And the ones that have walls and the ability to protect their data are going to be doing that. So uh, being able to deal directly with the premium environments is gonna be um, really important. And I think we'll see a lot of hiring, a lot of investment. We already see a lot of investment. There's a massive bubble right now in, um, in advertising technology and MarTech. Um, because there is so much, so much creativity and, and, and innovation happening on this side, dealing with the big fundamental structural changes. Amazing. Anybody else want to answer that question? I think I'm the only one left. There's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's, I, I like the sort of combination, I think, of what everyone said. I think the the more interactive formats you get and the more that uh, advertisers see content as an opportunity to use each impression as a learning environment um, and a learning opportunity, uh, you can then start to use the power of the targeting that you get through digital, the measurement that you get through digital to actually start to power your content strategy. Uh, and I think brands that are embracing that and are using that and are using that to start to try and be a little bit more interactive and learn a little bit more about their consumers, um, especially while it's been changeable times and, you know, and people have had a lot of stresses and a lot of uh, different things going on. It allows you to be reactive and allows you to be probably a little bit less nervous about getting it wrong as well. Um, and I think that for digital is a much nicer positioning as to where it should sit in the funnel and in the general marketing mix um, rather than it trying to compete on a, you know, sort of pure players just on the same metrics and performance. Um, it's got data. It's such a rich environment to learn from. Um, I think the advertisers that are using it for that are really sort of getting the most from it. Great. Cool. I think we've got some other questions um, that's coming. Yep. So we've got one for Tom from Danny here. Does your list of partners also include trade focused media providers? Yeah, so because we can measure really, really small campaigns, um, B2B, B2G, um, a lot of uh, the smaller campaigns can be measured. And it's really a matter of um, just engaging, talking to those partners and telling them, actually, as a marketer, you have to, you have to, we have all have to shift the conversation instead of just assuming they're not going to be able to give you this measurement, the thing that you need in order to defend your budget and defend your job. You can actually just ask them for it. And they might say, oh, I don't know how to do that. And, and, and if you have a suggestion, that's, that's a good conversation to have because ultimately they want your spend. They want the relationship to grow. And you got to be honest with what you need um, as in any relationship to, to about how that relationship is going to grow and, and be successful. So um, rather than just saying, ah, it's not working. Let me just put more money on Facebook and Google because nobody got fired for doing that. 
Brilliant. Um, so we're running slightly over, so we'll just ask one more question and then um, I'll hand over to you, Christine, to wrap up. Okay. Um, Julie's wondering, are you seeing any trends for the use of immersive like VR? I guess that's open to anybody. <laughs> Charlie, that's one for you, isn't it? <laughs> Probably is, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, bits and pieces. We work with um, uh, we work with a couple of furniture brands, and definitely augmented reality for them is you know is is a big area of expansion. Um, so being able to bring the product sort of into the room, uh, and has obviously been you know being key and being accelerated by what's happened over the course of the, sort of the last year. Um, I think from a VR point of view, it's probably still used a little bit more sort of you know in store and on site. Um, I know there was a fantastic Thomas Cook example back in the day where they've got this, uh, they got kids plugged into VR, sent them down a water slide uh, and they booked a sort of 100% of the holidays that they got the kids to do because uh, the parents wouldn't <laughs> let them leave the, leave the shop without. So I think it's, it's, it's still developing maybe a little bit more, but certainly augmented reality and the use of that within apps for, for a lot of our clients is, is growing. I mean, we, we were talking about this about 15 years ago when I worked for a, a kids network um, and and I don't think I've seen any digital ads that that kind of use it still. So I think we're still a way off augmented reality in in our space. I would I would think. I think it'll be it'll be initially pushed to as a sort of you know as an immersive experience, which will be hosted somewhere, and the ads will be pushed into it. I think you know we're we're going to be a little bit of time before the ads actually sort of are within the virtual reality, just because the the adoption of technology is not quite there in terms of within households and eyeballs. We're finding that um, the clients are using AR particularly uh, um, on ads and stuff because you can put QR codes on, on anything, whether it's digital or, or a, a printed a piece of collateral. Um, but I agree the VR has, has its place and, uh, you know, they, it's finding new places for it as well. But, um, yeah, it would be, be very nice to see a lot more of both of those platforms um, on digital, I must say. That'd be great. Well, that, that kind of wraps it up. Thank you very much to all our speakers, to Julia, Steph, uh, Charlie, Tom and Dan, um, and thank you very much to Julia Smith and her team for making the introductions of these lovely speakers. And of course, uh, thank you very much to our own marketing guru, to Abby at Salamander UK for making this all happen. And uh, to all the, um, to the lovely audience who've come to ask lo lovely questions and uh, made it all worthwhile. So thanks very much. Uh, also, sorry, one last thing. It will be on uh, Salamander UK website and our YouTube channel. Uh, we will be editing this up and it should be up on our channel. Uh, by, I'd say, next week, Abby? Yep. Cool. Thank you very much, guys. It's been amazing. Thanks for having us. Lovely. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks for having us. Cheers. Bye. 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 Bye.